With that uh, said, I think we've, we've come up to seven o'clock and I'm going to hand over to this evening's speaker, Neil Perrins. And I think you can share your uh, screen and we can just go, go ahead and start. Neil has said that he wants to introduce himself, so I'm not gonna say anything about him. And I don't know any, any good stories to tell anyway, so. <laughs> all right, let's hope this all works as it did earlier. Right, so you should be able to see the, the title screen of the, of the um, webinar. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people's names that I, I saw as they, they subscribe that I, I know through um, various birding excursions, twitches, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I started birding when I was a youngster, um, uh, really in, in home at Ramberg, but um, when we moved to Botswana, I was, you know, nine, 10 years old and riding around on my bicycle and birding um, in the suburb around Gaborone. Um So yes, um, welcome everyone. And um, it is my first webinar for, for Learn the Birds. And thank you all for, for joining tonight. I was, I was amazed at the response and uh, quite daunting to have a hundred plus people, <laughs> people sign up. Um, so yes, at, at times, I'll be going through some more technical aspects of both Scythal and, and Bird Lasser. We have a, a limited a bit amount of time, so I'm probably gonna go through a little bit quickly for you all to, to follow it during, during the presentation. Um, and we, we then, if there's enough interest, we'll do a masterclass later on with, with either um, Bird Lasser and or Scythal. So yes, as I said, I began birding as a youngster and I can remember looking at things like Bok Makiris in, in our cul-de-sac in Randburg, where they are very uncommon nowadays. Um, and I was probably about five or six years old, just starting school. Um, I enjoyed watching what, whatever I saw. We had huge flocks of, sort of sacred ibis flying over the house, um, probably 100, 120 at a time. And nowadays we saw, see sort of 10 to 12 flying over, over our house. Um, and I, I never thought counting birds was a thing. You know, I, I went and watched birds and I enjoyed watching what I was watching and, and never gave a hoot about uh, counting them or, or creating a list. Um, so I so say we moved to Botswana um, and they sort of really got into it. You know, we're seeing wax bills, crimson breasted shrikes, namaqua doves, indigo birds, as I was riding around the suburb. And just outside town, you would see hornbills and mayors parrots and that type of thing. So. My folks, my dad was a bird watcher, so he's the one who was really to blame for, for my, my passion. Um, and my folks used to take us out into the bush every other weekend and really had a good time in Botswana for the two years we lived there. So how did we start listing? Well, I, I say I never kept a, a list of species. And when we moved back to South Africa, we, we used to go on family trips to the various nature reserves, particularly Kruger Park. And here's where, where we started listing and you'd have your notebook and your pen and you'd, um, you'd start ticking off, writing down what you see, writing down the mammals you see, the birds you see. And it was always exciting to see how many birds and how many mammals you'd seen at the end of the trip. Um, but that list got put away after the trip and, and never really got collated into a, a life list or anything like that. Um, and in the 80s, you know, our computers were sort of, you start, you press the, the on button and go and make a cup of coffee, come back and wait another 15 minutes and it's eventually started up. And cell phones and smartphones were sort of a science fiction. We, we didn't even know anything about them in, the, in those days. So yeah, it was all pen and paper. And um, I was taken back to that, to those days. We were on one of the bird um, atlasing bashes out in, in the Northern Cape and put my phone on charge and headed off out into the bush. And uh, next thing the, the um, cigarette lighter charger fried itself and my phone was flat as a pancake. So what did I do? I had to use my Garmin in the car to get coordinates and I had to resort to pen and paper and, and go back to doing old school birding and atlasing. So it was, it was quite, quite fun and quite daunting when you're so used to just punching away on, on a smartphone. 
Oh, some someone scribbling on the screen. If you could just, um, I don't know, Derek, can you eliminate? There you go. Um, so yes, entering the slippery slope to listing. Um, it's something you start and you don't <laughs> don't go back from. So in 2006, a friend of mine, Hanno Langenhoven, he posted on, on the, the old SA bird net and said he wanted to go up to Katima Melillo and the surrounds and do big birding day there. Um, and so I responded, I said, my dad and I would be keen to join you. Um, and so he, he said, okay, uh, that, that's pretty good. But um, he obviously wanted to meet this oddball who was willing to travel thousands of kilometers just to go and do a, a extended weekend of birding. Um, and so we, we met at a coffee shop in Northgate and the first thing he says to me, so what's your life list? And I said, my what? And he says, your life list, you must have a life list. So I said, no, I don't count. I said, I just go and enjoy myself. And so he says, no, before we go on this trip, you, you've got to compile your list and tell me what it is and we'll see how many you've seen and, and see what we can add to your list. So just before the trip, um, obviously it was in November as the most uh, big birding days are. So in September, I bought Robert's Multimedia uh, for the PC and I entered in my list and yes, 383 species I could remember seeing. And that was how, how it all began. So off we went and now it was, there's the old pen, pen and uh, notebook. And so we would go birding, you'd write everything down that you saw, get back home after the trip and have to collate it into, the, into your listing program and um, see how many new ones you'd seen. Um, so on that trip, I added 58 lifers to my trip, um, to my list. Um, and I also met a, uh, another chap on the trip, uh, Peter Lachranzi. And he kept all sorts of lists. He kept trip lists, day lists, country lists, and wait for it, he kept year lists. And he said that getting to 500 in a year is a pretty good effort in Southern Africa. But we all know that's in a whole other story as I went about doing a, a big year in 2011, but um, I may write a book or sometime in the future may do a webinar on big years. So we, we shoot forward to May, May 2007. Um, I was off on another birding trip with Hanno and he jumped in the car and he said, you are really gonna enjoy this. And he hauled out his little um, Windows um, uh, PDA. And he had, it's, it's got an interface similar to what, what we see on our smartphones today. Um, I don't know how many of you used, used an old uh, PDA. You, Robert's Multimedia came out with the SD card you plugged into your PDA and so you had Robert's at your fingertips, which was re really something in those days. And um, he popped up with this strange app on it. It was called CyberTracker. And he says, no, no, what you've got is your bird list. And you go and you choose your bird and you tick your bird. And you get back home, you plug it into the PC, you put the PC interface and you download it all. So it, it's a South African developed app and it was basically for recording biodiversity in, in the very unex various unexplored regions of South Africa. Um, and some friends had made a sequence that uh, had a bird list of Southern Africa. And it was for either just listing the, the bird species, or you could do more advanced things like counting the, the sexes of birds, the number of birds, whether they're nest, nesting and, and more, um, it's related uh, data. So this recorded your point data. So it recorded your GPS location, your date, your time, the bird name, and any other data that you'd entered. It was a bit of a game changer. We can now log every sighting, not worry about pen and paper, and the PC-based interface would then create, uh, drop it down into spreadsheets. And this data could then be exported into various um, spreadsheets or other methods you had of recording your data. So this is the PC interface. Um, you, would, you would have your sequence, you could upload it to the PDA, and then you could download your data from the PDA as, it, as you linked it to the PC. Um, so as I, as I began to travel and outside of the region, I, I sort of taught myself how to edit these sequences and the sequence in layman terms is a tickable list. And so I developed sequences for various countries I started to visit. And the first I visited was, um, with this program was Peru. And so it was, Peru's got the second highest list of birds in the world, close to 2000. So it was a hell of a list to create. So good learning curve. 
Um, I kept spreadsheets for each list I created and imported them into Microsoft Access. Um, I, I still keep an access list. I download my, my sightings from Birdlasser and from various other apps I've used over the years. And I've got over 300,000 records in that at the moment. Aligned to this, I kept spreadsheets, a country, country list for each country. And as, I, as well as my South African list, I didn't, Trevor didn't have a list that he shared in those days. So I, I had the, the Robert's checklist and um, I would go and check off what I'd seen, what I'd photographed and keep that updated. Um, and then obviously as we got new birds discovered in the region or we had splits or we had lumps, I had to go and change that list. So it, it was a lot of admin. Um, and in the old days, everything was quite a bit of admin. I think we're very lucky nowadays. So Kevin was in, instrumental in, in developing that first cyber tracker um, list that we used. And he developed this um, app on, um, I think it was both Android and, and Apple called Gbird. And this was sort of even better because now you didn't have to worry about sequences that had every bird in the world in it. Um, it had their range maps in it. And you just logged into this on your smartphone and away you went and logged what you what you wanted and you came back and uploaded it to the were uploaded through the, the internet to his um, website. And you could then download your sightings from the website, which I did and kept in my access database. Um, it, uh, I used it a, a extensively overseas. Um, and so it had every bird in the world, so it was quite useful. And then there was fun features like the website where you could view your trips on, on Google Earth. It um, would also mark a species as red if you recorded in the field and it shouldn't be where you are. So you, you knew straight away if you've got an outer range bird, you needed to have a look a lot more carefully and make sure you, you knew what you were seeing. Um, but unfortunately, support ended sometime around 2012. So we had to switch to something else to, to do our lists. And then we'll diversify a little bit now um, into the atlasing. Um, Save App 1 was, took place in the, the early to late 90s. Um, Save App 2, um, which is run by the Animal Demograph Demography Unit of the um, um, University of Cape Town, um, started Save App 2 in, I think it was July 2007, and have since diversified diversified it into BirdMap, which covers um, every other African country that, that, that does atlasing. So it was two months after I started using CyberTracker. Um, and so I had had my data coming into spreadsheets anyway. They had something called the data management system, which I hated. Some people loved it and still love it and tr still try and use it. It was very, what I'll call clunky. Um, and it was the preferred choice to enter data into, into the project. So you'd go out, you'd record the bird you saw in a pentad, and you would come back and enter it into the data management system, which to me is, um, I don't like, I like to take shortcuts. I like to make things easy. So I would dump the spreadsheet out of, out of um, CyberTrack at that stage. And I would then import the spreadsheet into the other alternative to the DMS, which was um, entering it into a spreadsheet manually and um, then uploading it to, to the ADU. And I uh, manufactured a couple of formulas that made it really easy. Just had a couple of things to do on timing. Uh, so whether you'd have done one or two hours um, or more and then how many species per hour. So in pretty much a quarter of an hour, I could get my whole trip done into the various pentads I visited and upload it. Um, and it worked very well. So after that, um, I say it continued for several years. Years, um, smartphones became more sophisticated, and the trusty PDA remained as my means of capturing my infield data on CyberTracker. And then along came Lynx bird ticks, and I've pretty much for for a long time I've used an iPhone. Um, so you've got your two, two operating systems, your iOS and your Android phones. And these chaps developed Lynx bird ticks, but only on the Android um, system. So this was also sometime in 2012 when Gbird had sort of stopped functioning. And it worked out your 
time that you spent in, in a penta at your effort and had the completed bird list, um, which you ticked off and it worked out the pentads, it told you when you were changing pentads, how many species you'd seen per hour and so on. And with a few entries at the end of your, your trip, you could um, put in whether it was full or ad hoc card and so on. And then you upload it straight from the app directly into the server. And it was a godsend for, um, for Android users that is, and probably assist in getting a large number of people um, involved in the Atlas project because the, the, the amount of admin that most people spent on, on the Atlas project was really a, a deterrent for them um, submitting data to, to the project. Um, and unfortunately, as I had the iPhone, I wasn't able to use it. So I went and um, found an El Cheapo phone, about 300 Rand at CNA, which was an Android and wanted to see how this thing worked. And then I started to use that um, with my clumsy big fingers. I got um, a few errors in the, the species, of course, as we still do. Um, and it was, it was really easy. And we started to come across some, some fairly bad bugs in the system. And we, we started to um, send the request through to the guys at, at Lynx saying, please, can you fix this? And they were very unresponsive, um, which was quite annoying. Um, but I think the developers were in the US. So you've got the, the two-tier um, uh, two problem is that you've got to report it to the guys in, in SA. They've got to take it up with the guys in the States. The guys in the States then have to find the time to do it, send it back down. The guys in the SA have to test it. And um, so it, it sort of died at death. And it died at death when the system we all know nowadays, bird lesser. So spot, plot, play a part, that's their slogan. Um, and this came about in April 2014. And I was contacted by a friend and said, do you want to be a tester of this new, this new product? Um, and so I said, okay, it's a company called Legint, um, comprising a team that was led by Hank Nell. And it was pri primarily for bird um, atlasing in South Africa when it was first released. Um, it was released, I'll say in April, 2014 as, as a test space. And that was only on iPhone and Android was roughly a year later. So I took it on, I said, okay, I'll test this thing. And in typical parents fashion, I managed to find lots of bugs um, and develop some of my own. Um, and in October 2014, I was in um, uh, in Mozambique on one of the remote peninsulas. So there was no cell phone reception. And I started logging things and you try and log something. And instead of the, you know, bird lasser tells you you're 1200 meters away from being accurate, you're 500 meters away from being accurate, you're 50 meters from being accurate, and then it will eventually log the, the bird for you. Mine would go 100, you're 100 meters accurate, 200 meters, 300 meters, 1000 meters, 2000 meters, and keep drifting out. And so my workaround was to go into another app that I had, which was just an altimeter, and that would grab a GPS signal. I would go back into bird lasso, would now have a 25 meter accuracy, I'd log the bird and go on to the next one. Um, so I, I told Hank and his guy in Cornelis, who's the developer on, on Apple, I said, guys, this is a really weird problem. Um, so eventually the, the solution was they, they said, can we use your phone? So they took my iPhone, they traveled into Lesotho where there was zero signal and they um, saw that exactly what was happening, that the, the um, GPS was drifting further away. And so Cornelis um, took the app that did the altimeter thing, wrote that code into, um, into Bird Lasser, and there, there we had, well, they had a fix. Um, so it's, the app has helped me to, to submit close to a thousand cards in, um, in South Africa, apart from the, the others that I did before Bird Lasser, and thousands of ad hoc and incidental re records. Um, and, what I, what I normally do in typical fashion is I, I don't like to go and submit, submit after each trip. So I would wait, wait a week or two and then go and submit all my data. And Hank would say, what are you doing? Because the data at the rate I was submitting, it would crash the server um, on overload. So I said, I don't know if Hank was glad or mad that he asked me to be a tester of the system. Anyway, I've, I've, I've carried on and really enjoyed it. And, the guys are really responsive and, and do a great job of, of 
um, getting what we want into the app. So I'm, so I'm very much a believer in giving information if you expect to receive. So I support the various projects that I do and I still use bird less extensively, extensively for atlasing. So every African trip I do, I run a checklist in atlas mode and I submit these to the project. So bird lasso has expanded. Um, it's now used in every African country that runs an atlas project. Um, it uh, runs under the title of bird map. Uh, it's such an easy to use system that um, the guys in the various countries have, have taken it up very well. And we're starting to get good coverage in countries such as Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya. Uh, Tanzania has got their own system, so they do not run it. Um, and I believe it's in a few other, other countries. Um, it's obviously in Southern African countries, um, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, um, but they were taken up later than, than the South African project. Um, so yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're traveling um, and you're in Africa, um, please uh, log what you see on Bird Lasso. The, the countries are all there. Um, when you go in to log something, it will come up, it'll, it'll bring up the list. So if you see on the, on the left there, I've circled SNA, you click that as a drop down box and it comes up with all the, all the various countries. So this is, this is Africa as well as outside of Africa. So um, when we actually saw the sooty gull in Kai Mouth, um, it wasn't listed on the app, obviously sooty gull had never been seen in South Africa before, um, apart from St. Lucia record. Um, so I quickly went into that, clicked SNA, went to East Africa, logged the sooty gull, went back into that and changed it back to Southern Africa. Um, so yeah, and, um, myself and various other users of Bird Lasso have nagged and nagged and nagged poor old Hank. And um, we've said, please, can you load a country list for X where I'm going to Uganda, have you got it there? And I'm going to Guatemala, have you got it there? And, and so he tirelessly went, carried on and his guys added the, the species lists. Um, and Hank told me in, in one conversation that it took him five minutes, minutes per species. So now there's, um, 10,000 plus species in the world. So it's a hell of an undertaking. Um, so the, the country lists now cover almost every single species on the planet. So he said there was just a couple of islands where the endemics haven't been added, but that will still be done. Um, so I've, I've used bird lasso to record sightings in Vietnam, China, Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Peru, Honduras, Guatemala, and Brazil. And um, we'll discuss more on the export and management of those lists a little later. So by entering your data into a log trip card, um, then on iPhone, pressing the, the three dots, uh, it's a little different on an Android phone, and we'll go through, through that at a later stage if anyone really wants to. Um, then depending on what you intend doing, you share or export to CSV. Um, on the share function, you are basically submitting to BirdMap or, or SaveApp2. Um, it's just been defined as BirdMap to cover the whole of Africa. So you go and click on, on bird map, it comes up, it brings up the header of the card and or each, it brings up the header of each um, pen tab that you've done. But you then go and choose you've done um, an ad hoc or you've done a full card, whether you've, put, you've covered the entire pen tab, whether you've atlas at night and how many hours you spent, which should be automatic in bird lesser. And it'll then warn you if you haven't done two hours, it'll say, are you sure you did a full pen tab? Um, so it, it's all pretty powerful nowadays. Um, export CSV is um, what I use to, to mail. You mail the CSV file, you save it to your PC, and then I'll, I'll import that into my other listing program called Scythe Um as, So I'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, and as, an, as a bit of an aside, um, I've traveled with several people. They say, no, I use, I use um, Bird Lesser. My, I do say that. And so, so how many cards have you submitted? They, what do you mean submit? And so, no, it doesn't automatically send it into SABAP. You need to go in and tell the, the on each header of each pen tab what you've actually done, whether you've done a full uh, protocol or um, ad hoc. So, yeah, it's, it, it's good, but it's, it's not, it, I can't read your mind. <laughs> so, um, on to our next thing. There's um, it's a lesser known feature of, of Bird Lesser. Um, so, it keeps a list of 
of everything you log um, and it can so initially you'll have the top top line there that says all so it'll it'll show you how many species you've logged throughout the world and then you press the plus button on the top right and you can add things like I've added the African continent, Gauteng, Kruger National Park, South Africa, Southern Africa, Wada Gauteng and Zimbabwe. Um, these are only since 2014 so you can go and uh, enter your, your historical data if you sort of know where more or less you've seen everything. Um, I haven't got around to that yet, so I'm, I'm sort of 33 shy on my Southern African list. I'm about 40 shy on my um, South African list. Um, and hopefully I'll see them again, so I won't need to go and do that, that exercise. So this, this also has an export function. Um, you can go into each list and you can export that list. Um, so you'll have a list of Africa, a list of all. Um, it only exports the, the first record that you've seen in each region. So the more you narrow down the regions, the more you can get a, a more complete list. So one of the reasons um, a lot of people came onto this was Darby Clayhans posted something on Facebook and I, I saw a lot of people who'd commented on there are now uh, attendees on, on this webinar. Um, and he asked, what do you use to list your birds? Um, so well, not just birds, but everything else. So there's a whole other host of apps out there and um, Strike Nature has, has got a, a lot of them. Um, the other chaps who did bird pro have also done the dragonflies and the tree app that you can see on here. Um, Colin's bird guide is, is um, the electronic version of the book. It was launched back in 2014, I think, at the British Bird Fair. Um, and PK Birds is Guy Gibbons, Robert's version of Australian birds. Um, so yeah, depending where you're traveling, there's, there's a whole wealth of, of um, apps out there um, that are actually not too expensive. If you think about it, you're going to pay three, four hundred rand for a book, then you've got to tote that book around with you. You pay three, four hundred rand for an app, and then it's, it's all at your fingertips. Um, I was very involved with with Cecil, um, both on the book side and and the eBird side. Now I'm still um, involved in getting uh, the little buggy bits that people keep finding out of it and adding uh, content to it. But one of the very powerful sides of, of Cecil is the, the listing side, which um, it's highly confusing when you first go in and you don't know how it works. But once you sort of work on the logic and get your head around it, you can get some incredible lists out of it. Your day trips, trip lists, um, site lists, year lists, uh, really, really, really powerful. And the other eFrogs, eGuide to Birds of East Africa, your e-snakes, uh, Stuart's SA mammals, and butterflies of SA are all produced by Strike Nature and all have similar interfaces. So you can make really powerful lists out of them. And added to that, you can export um, into CSV files so you can import it into the various um, apps that you may have or Scytheville as we would, will discuss in due, due course. So in, in 2010, I went to Uganda and I met a crazy American um, who had 5,000 birds on his world list, but they were all on this, this um, program called Asus. And as I've titled it there, it's great if you love Clements, and it sadly died with his creator. Um, so there's, there's two main um, taxonomies in the world. There's Clements, which the majority of Americans use, and there's IOC, which the rest of the world uses. Um, so IOC tends to split more liberally unless you're in America where Clements tends to split more liberally. So <laughs> it's quite an interesting thing. So anyway, I, I watched him entering everything into this program and getting some reports out of it. He showed me how, how it worked. I thought this is a really good system. So I, I actually bought the, the package um, and I then had had the issue that was only based on Clements. So I would go and enter my data and Atlantic and Indian yellownose albatross are one species and northern and southern royal are one species. So I always had to reconcile between my South African list and my um, avicis list. So I had all my lists on it. Um, I got progressively irritated. Uh, I like things to work my way and if it doesn't work my way, I want it to be fixed. Um, so the, the creator say it, it, he died in 2015 and support sort of stopped for, for the system and 
um, development stopped on the system. Um, the downside of having one developer um, um, producing a program with no backup. And my attention to entering DART had to waned a little bit um, due to the Clements bias. And then we move on to 2012. And I found during a search, I think it was on, on the web, a program called Scythal. Um, so I, I had a look into this and I opened it up and I looked at the, the website, looked at the manuals and thought this actually looks pretty damn fine. So it's a, a chap called Adam Weiner, it's brainchild. Um, he's a software developer. Um, I think he still works for Google. I, I'm not sure, but I think he is. Um, and he's developed it as open source, open source so that um, the code is freely available to anyone who wants to have a look at it. And if he should get hit by a bus or something else, someone else can take over that code and carry on to develop it. Um, so it's not likely to die uh, with him as, as happened with Avisys. Um, and I've not looked back, I've, I've imported my data. It, it's got a very, very comprehensive manual which shows you how to set up your spreadsheets. So all my country spreadsheets I took and just had to manipulate slightly and imported them into this, into this program. Um, so I now have my entire world list sitting on, on Sidebull. Um, it's free to use, so it's, it's totally freeware. Um, so it has a comprehensive online manual. Uh, most importantly, it covers how to import those spreadsheets that you may have been keeping. So this, this bird, this, the scythe bill, um, it's obviously named after the shape of its bill. Um, this is one of five species of wood creeper, which is an oven bird found in South America and Central America. And the startup image is, is a red billed scythe bill, and I still have to see a scythe bill. So yes, I've got something to get back there for. Um, even though it's American written, uh, who are the Clements guys, Adam's taken a, a broad-minded approach and he's got Clements and IOC taxonomy built into the app or into the, into the program, uh, which makes it obviously more attractive to a wider audience. And you can seamlessly switch between the two. So um, if you look in the top, uh, it's very small on the screen, but if you look in the top um, left, you can see taxonomy IOC, which is my choice. I can switch into Clements, it'll tell me my totals and I can switch back and it'll tell me my total in IOC. So it starts up with quite a neat menu. Um, the default is the top life list, so that's my world life list. And it'll be the only, only line item there when you first start the program. Um, and I've added, so these others are my own that I've added, such as Africa, Southern Africa, and so on. You can change that and, and delete them and add other ones through the reports menu. So we run through the, the menu options. So you've got enter sightings, show reports, browse by species, browse by location, special reports, and your preferences. So first we, we go to um, enter sightings. So this is if, you, if you've got old lists that you don't have spreadsheets for and you want to enter it in there, you, you would go in. Um, who is your observer name? I default with, with my own name. Um, when you put your date that you recorded it, your start time and where, and um, we'll go more into locations later, but for example, I put here is the 21st of Jan, seven o'clock in my Ramberg garden. Um, or you can choose a recent visit and add to that, that um, data. If you've forgotten to log something in the field, you can go and add to that data. Um, and then that will take you into a, into a um, screen where you go and start entering all your species. Um, and if you're brave, you can enter subspecies as well. That's a, a an optional choice to enter species or subspecies and subspecies. So I did this um, for a couple of old lists. One, the most memorable is um, we went to England in 1980. Um, I spent a month there and I would go off into the field um, on my own with a pair of binoculars and write down what I saw um, and kept this notebook and found it when I started using Sidebull, found it in my drawer. And, it actually had been chewed by my dog. My teacher wouldn't believe me, but it had been chewed by my dog, but I could still read it and enter my English list from that. So that was quite nice. So next is the pretty powerful reporting function. Um, 
So down down the left where I pulled down the drop down, you can see you can choose location, date, observers, first record, your, in other words, your life is, um, whether you heard it only, uh, you are you seeing red list, so if you want endangered species, uh, least concern, etc. cetera. Um, status, so breeding or not, breeding code, so nest, number of nests and so on. Um, if you photographed it, so you've got an option to, to tick photograph next to each sighting. Um, any notes you made, uh, your visit comments, sex and age of the birds, time cited, family, subspecies, species hybrid. So these are things that you, you may or may not enter. Um, most of my my sightings, I mean, you, you're flying through through the bush, Krug or whatever, and you're just logging the species name. And if, if it's um, evident, you'll log it as male or female. But um, so the, the majority of my my reports are location with date um, and pulling out my life as every now and then and whether I photographed it or not. Uh, those are probably the main main things I use. So if you look at the bottom sort of last little box on the right it's got remember written in there you click on remember and it'll it'll pop it up into your your list on your start screen so if you went um location south africa um and left the date blank and clicked on remember it would put south africa up on your your um, startup screen so it's it's quite useful if you want to just have those um those items as you as you go into the program so you can browse by species. Um, so you, it'll show your own sightings on the right. So you'll choose the species. Um, it's, it's got an intelligent, uh, same as bird lesser. So you'll type FMCU and it'll bring up African Emerald Cuckoo. Um, and the reason I chose African Emerald Cuckoo is because you usually hear them more than you see them. So if you look on the right hand side, you can see all my sightings, but um, it's got a little H in front of probably the, yes, the vast majority of them on the right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to see, I, I record everything whether I've heard it or seen it on Bird Lesser um, with your left swipe of your thumb. Um, and that transfers through into Scythable. So it's, it's quite nice to, to be able to say, I want to see my, I want to have my seen only or my heard only records. So then um, browsing by location. So. There's a hell of a lot of work has gone into this into this um, program. So it's got all the country lists, just about all the country lists in the world. So South Africa is pre-populated. Um, we've got so a little small discrepancy and it's mainly due to um, things like Elgin buzzard um, and possibly a, a species that hasn't been seen for many, many years, like Newt Swan is on there. Um, so I think it should be 865. Um, so, on, on the country, so I've gone to South Africa, and the top line in bold, so it shows your total species seen, um, in brackets, how many of the endemics you've seen, and then the next set is, you've seen 780 out of the 867, you've seen 17 out of the 18 endemic, Olgin buzzard is listed as an endemic, that's the reason, and you've um, still got 26 lifers to see in that country, so from my side, they're probably mainly seabirds that I still need to see. But the, the other um, fun thing here is you can say hide rarities. So I clicked on hide rarities earlier to see what would happen. And I was very pleased to see that I've, I've got a uh, new South African pass rate of 107%. I've seen 780 out of 730 species. So as you, as you start to use the program, um, and if you look on the bottom left, you can see Northwest and the various um, locations that I've created, Assen, Assen Surrounds, uh, Assen Road, and down to Borokalala National Park. So here I've jumped to Borokalala National Park, and it gives me my total records for the park of 275. And if you look on the column on the right, you've got dates of your visits. So you can go and choose any of those, those visits and go and see how many species you've seen in that, in that visit. So the special reports um, has some interesting ones. It's got big days and years, total ticks, year comparisons, uh, which tend to generate some in interesting data into, into spreadsheets. 
um, splits and lumps, which is quite useful when you update the program with the latest version of IOC or Clements, and it will then show you what you've gained or lost. So birds are getting split all the time and occasionally some get lumped. Um, so it'll show you what you've gained and lost on, on each update. And you can go historically go back and see what's, what's happened as long as you put the dates in correctly. And the last one is quite fun. It's a world lifers map, which will show you how many birds you can still see in each country um, on a, base, a web, web based uh, page, which I'll show you next. So this is my, my target list. Uh, so, so it's quite fun. So it goes from really where you can get nothing. So Botswana, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Swaziland uh, are white um, up to Brazil, where I can get 1,172 lifers. Um, so yes, the, and, you, and you can see on the color, color coded um, areas where you really need to go. So I need to go to Brazil, to Indonesia, to India, to Mexico, and really I need to spend time in South America. That's the, the bottom line. So the last, the last option is your preferences. Um, so your taxonomy at the top, your, your main taxonomy, so that's IOC um, as opposed to, to Clements. Um, then you can choose your, your species names language, uh, your species names IOC language, which um, even has Afrikaans as an option. So I know there's several people I've birded with that prefer to use Afrikaans names. So it'll have your Afrikaans and your scientific in your lists. Um, so although the menus are in English, you, you'll still have your Afrikaans lists. Um, and the other options, you'll, you count introduced species. So I think um, they've been here so long that we have to count them, things such as common minor, um, house sparrow, and so on. Um, and whether you count herd species towards your list, which um, there are some funny people in the world, the, the Scandinavians will count something that they've heard or been in the presence of someone who's seen something, they'll count that too. Um, and then counting undescribed species. So Elgin buzzard, for example, I've, I've seen it in the Cape. Um, it's not known what exactly the species is. They, they need to do a lot more work on it. Um, so I've, I've unticked that. Um, and then you can do backups. So you can choose where you want to do your backups um, and whether you want to do them daily, weekly, monthly. Um, and then observer preferences. So you can have yourself and your wife or partner and or you can add several other people if you're going on a trip and want to have their their um, observations in, on, a, on a card. So where you saw me enter the, the manual card, you can actually go and add different observers. So you can have a, a, a list for them as well of each thing that you've, you, each list that you've done. So Bird Lasso collaborated with, um, with the guys at uh, Sidebull, Adam and Co um, to make imports of their data compatible with, with the software. Um, so I like using bird lasser. So the recording method in bird lasser suits me down to a T because now I can export my data that I'm recording day to day into my preferred listing program, which is Scythal. So going back to the, the same slide we looked at earlier, you'll export your CSV, you'll mail it. You'll then save that, that CSV file. Um, just make sure you know where you've saved it. Um, and then you'll go into your into Scythal, you'll press Control I, and it'll bring up this box on the on the bottom right. Um, your default should have import from Birdlesser if you've done it before. Um, otherwise, you choose the, the lower drop down, which is import from, and the one of the options will be import from Birdlesser. So as as you start to import data um, and Initially, it, it's quite cumbersome because every every single location you've been to and recorded birds, it's going to want to put a new location in. So initially, it's got South Africa and it's got the provinces. So this, for example, was a trip to Northwest. Um, we were going looking for monotonous locks um, near Assen. And uh, just above the little pin that you can see there, you can see the road crosses the Pinals River. So Assen Road to Pinals River Bridge is probably the closest hotspot um, in eBird. So I've chosen that and, and dropped my data into that. And then you'll click next on the bottom right and it'll carry on. And so as you bird more and more in an area, the, the, the locations will be saved in Sidebull and it will just slot them into those locations and you won't need to go through this every time. So 
so I use, as I say, I use Sidebull as my listing program. So um, you have the option to refine each checklist, um, which is basically for eBird. So if you're exporting the data and refining the checklist on, on the eBird web page, um, you don't have to do it here. But I like to have the data in similar fashion on, on both, in both sites. Um, so uh, I choose browse by location. I choose Homo Homo because I knew, knew I'd been there. I chose the 15th of January, or I think that was the 16th of January. Um, then you've got eBird observation type, so in that red ring, um, which you will choose historical, stationary, traveling. So if you were standing on Homo Homo Bridge and not moving and counting birds, you would put stationary. Your start time is automatic from, from Bird Lasser. Your duration, Bird Lasser works out, and your distance, Bird Lasser works out. Um, if you're going backwards and forwards into a pentad, it, it sometimes gets a bit iffy. So you need to sort of have an idea of what what distance you did in that in that hot hotspot um, for eBird. Uh, party size. So how many of you were in the you know birding in, on the trip? So um, if there was a guy driving in, you know, two you birding, you put party size two. Um, if the driver was a birdie, you put party size three, and so on. And then um, complete sighting. So did you did you um, Count, did you log everything you saw or heard, or did you just put things down that you, you sort of note, took note of, um, in which case you would uncheck that box? So setting up an eBird export. Um, so I was traveling, I was birding on the 15th of January. So I would choose date um, during 15th of January, which would probably have several checklists um, aligned to it. Um, and you'd see the total species 90, which um, incidentally doesn't include your herd species. So it includes what you've seen, actually seen during the day, but will export the herd onlys as well. Um, you choose the drop down at the bottom left, export sightings, and the first option will be to eBird. Um, and then you will save it. So it'll Pull up, pull up the little um, uh, box in the middle there. So I've got a folder I call Scytheville, save it there. It comes up as file name, eBird export 2021-0115. So remember the location and the, and the file name. And we'll, we'll get to eBird shortly and I'll show you how we import that. So the, the other thing in, in Scytheville is um, it allows you to develop your own taxonomies. Um, there's various taxonomies available on the website. Um, eBird, Clements, and IRC are the two built in, which is the birding, the birding taxonomies. Um, I've then downloaded Australian reptiles, Australian frogs, and mammal watching, which are on the, the Sidebull website. Um, then I created my own, which was reptiles of South Africa, and Odonata of, South, of Africa, which is your damselflies and dragonflies, and butterflies of South Africa. And the, the manuals are, are super well written and, and easy to follow. So it's quite easy to, to develop the spreadsheet and import it into a taxonomy. So if you want to put orchids of South Africa or whatever, you you be quite easy, it would be quite easy for you to make your own taxonomy just with a little bit of reading of the manual. So on to eBird. Um, I know uh, the, the SABAP guys don't want me to really discuss eBird because uh, um, there have been people who've shied away from SABAP saying it's too cumbersome and have started logging things on eBird. Um, eBird sort of was, is, is a Cornell um, lab of ornithology brainchild. Um, so it was developed in the States. Um, and I, I use the eBird data when I travel overseas. So I'll go to look at the various hotspots. I'll see what's been seen and I'll see where, where I can go and find the various lifers that I need. So um, you, when you take, you've got to give. So I, I share my data with them as well. Um, pri primarily my South African and African data goes to SABAP, um, but my hotspot data goes into, um, into eBird as well. So this is all exported from Scythebull. Um, and if you noticed an earlier slide, um, one of the options in, in um, BirdLasser when you go to export is export to, or, or share the data, export to CSV, and the next option is export to, to eBird. And anyone who looked closely would have seen I put a red line through that. Um, basically, the reason is every eBird hotspot you go into, you've got to do a new um, 
trip card on Burlasa to do. So it, it's quite cumbersome to do that because you've got to know what hotspot you're going near and you've got to start a new card for each hotspot, which doesn't then work with your pen tabs because the, the pen tabs and hotspots will differ. Um, so I import it into, into Scythebill, it puts it into hotspots um, regardless of the pen tab, and then I can export from Scythebill to, to import into eBird. So this is your sort of my eBird page that you'll get on, on um, the eBird website, eBird.org. Um, and once you go into my eBird, you're going to see a list on the left, manage my checklist locations alert data import. So we're going to go into data imports and I think I've mentioned it, it uses hotspots. Um, so what has happened in, in a lot of cases is, for example, your guide will say, we're going to Sony Pass today. So you'll get eight Americans jumping into the combi and they'll go, okay, we're going to Sony Pass and they'll log in everything under Sony Pass. Um, so you'll get things like kelp gull going right up to Mountain Pippet. Um, so <laughs> there's, there's some inaccurate data in there. There's a lot of guys vetting the data nowadays. Um, so it's becoming more and more accurate. Um, and you'll actually see some of the, the older hotspots have now got um, in brackets after it's got, please be more specific. So they'll keep the old data, but they want you to go into a smaller based hotspot. Um, in, in America, you can go into a park and you, every single hive will have its own hotspot and every single section of the park um, will have its own hotspot. So it's a bit of an overkill. Um, but yeah, as I say, if you're traveling wide, uh, eBird is invaluable. So how do I get my data into eBird? So you've clicked on data imports on, on the left there and you'll come into this, this screen. Um, so we exported from Scythebill as I showed you earlier um, and you need to remember that uh, folder and the name. And you, in order to start doing this, you obviously need to register on eBird, have a, a login um, so that you have a My eBird account. Um, and you go to import a file, you choose the location where that you've saved that file and import it into this. Um, it, if you've done the process correctly in, in Sizebill and put it into hotspots or Google um, locations, it should be pretty seamless. Um, otherwise it will say, okay, you need to just, um, you need to identify this location. And if your species haven't got um, subspecies names, you will need to, um, you'll need to identify which subspecies it is. So it's not an American white egret or great egret, it's a, an African great egret, for example. So the next thing is um, if we didn't do the, the process of editing your checklist um, in, in Scythebill, you can now go and do it in, in eBird. So you would go to checklists on the left and you'd pop into your checklist. So we've, there we've got the 15th of January um, and we've got Homo Homo, which um, is one that we know we entered. And so we will go into Homo Homo. You will click on the date 15th of January, uh, number 5726. So here you've got um, two options. You've got on the top left with the arrow, you've got edit date and effort. And on the right, you've got edit species. So our first process is to go and edit date and effort. Um, so the species numbers were dropping as we were there in the evening. Um, so I felt it was complete, so I would put it as complete. We were walking on the bridge um, for about a kilometer. Um, so it automatically has the start time. It automatically works out the duration. I changed the observation type from historical to traveling and enter the party sizes too. You click on save changes. So what eBird does, um, you can go into your into your um, card. So you'll go and edit species and say that it was complete, which is the previous option. Um, click on the right, edit species. On the bottom right, you'll have complete yes or no, you'll choose yes. Um, and then you see on the left of that, you've got add media. So you can add your photographs, um, you can add your recordings if you make recordings. And what it, it's really good is that, it firstly is a backup of all your photographs. Um, 
albeit uh, a little bit lower resolution. But any PC that you're on in the world, you can go and access your data and look at your photographs, look, um, pull up your recordings. So really useful. So another another um, resource that um, the Cornell Lab has has now recently launched uh, used to be Hamburg, Handbook of Birds, Birds of the World, which they took over, and it's now birdsoftheworld.org. Um, so it, it's Clements based, unfortunately, but um, it, and it's a subscription based um, system. So it's a, it's a web page. You pay forty nine dollars a year, which is not too bad considering that you've got every bird species in the world. You've got their distributions. You've got a whole bunch of information, um, information on subspecies, and it's linked to eBird. So as you can see, Southern Red Bull Hornbill. I've got my scene. I've seen it. I've photographed it. I haven't recorded it, but I can click on that photo icon, and it will go into my photographs of the species. Um, if you go further down the page, you'll be able to go into all the photographs taken by everyone in the world, um, all the recordings made, and you'll, I say, you'll have all that that text and data relating to that species. That sort of brings us to the end of, of this, as I say, pretty much rushed through a hell of a lot of detail in, in a shortish space of time. Um, but the, the web pages I've mentioned, um, so I think we'll leave it on this, on this page for a while. So you've got um, SABAP2, which has changed now to sabap2.birdmap.africa to align itself with the rest of Africa, uh, birdlasser.com, which they have a whole bunch of fun challenges. So you, you log into that and you, you can um, enter Wairakauteng, Gauteng, South African, um, and a whole host of other um, sort of fun challenges that you can do around, around the, the continent mainly. Um, eBird is eBird.org. Um, Birds of the World is birdsoftheworld.org. Um, and the IRC um, data that you see in, in Scytheville um, all his ranges of the species, the names of the species, the subspecies, is all pulled from the IOC database, which is kept on worldbirdnames.org. Um, quite a useful website as well. Um, my two web pages, neil.co.za, where I store a lot of my images um, of birds and various other wildlife. Um, I also manage the Durban Pelagics from there. Um, so go along and have a look at that. And then my company is bustedsbirding.co.za where we have details on trips and day trips that if you're interested in doing, you can go and um, get, in, get hold of us from there. Um, no, so we, we rushed, we'll rush through it pretty quickly. Um, there's a hell of a lot more detail in, in both Scythal um, and eBird. Um, we do masterclasses, which um, there's a small fee for, for attending them. But if there is any interest in, in looking further into these things, um, please email me on neil at bustedsbirding.co.za. Um, yeah, so they have a small fee attached to them. So Derek, I don't know what you've seen in the chat session. Yeah, so there's been a lot of discussion, um, but there doesn't seem to be a obvious question right now. Uh, there's been some questions that have been answered. Um, and uh, there's one from, uh, from someone who's asking, did you ever consider go iTerra? So yes, I, I have. I've gone on Igoterra. Um, I've subscribed to Igoterra for a few years, um, but it's it's not to me. It's not as straightforward as um, you know. E eBird is not my primary listing program. So similarly, Igoterra is not my primary listing listing program. Um, I've loaded several of my photographs up where they haven't had photographs, just to sort of get them a more complete database. Um, but I also found it quite difficult to use. It, um, it's pretty involved to go and create a list. Um, so I didn't want to go and you know, reinvent the wheel type thing. Are there any other questions, folks? Uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting for a couple of more questions, I'm going to just put in a plug for next week's webinar. Um, for, for those of you who are interested in exotic places, we have a presentation from a very exotic place uh, next week. It's called Birding the Wildest Islands of the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago. And it's been given by Faraz Abdul. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Faraz, but he is, he eats, sleeps and lives and breathes birds. 
Uh, he's written a book on birds uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. He's also a, a tour guide for the region, and uh, he is, uh, is a magnificent photographer. I've seen some of his photographs and some of the things he's going to use in his presentation, and I think you're going to be blown away. So please don't miss that one next week, uh, January the 28th uh, at 7 p.m. in South Africa, and uh, birding the wildest islands of the uh, Caribbean. So let's see what questions we have here now. Um, uh, Etienne is saying it's worth just recognizing Neil's huge contribution to bird atlasing and monitoring in the region. Uh, very interesting talk. I have been sitting on the side on side bill. Uh, then Henny says, hi, Neil. Uh, what was your experience with bird lasser outside of Africa? Is it useful for recording outside of Africa? So I think I've, I've answered that. Um, mm. So yeah, Hank and the guys have, you know, if, if I'm going to a country, they'll say they've got just about every species in the world in into bird lesser now. Um, so given enough, enough notice and enough nagging, um, Hank will put the put the country list together for you. So anywhere I've been, I've been able to log on bird lesser anywhere since basically 20, late 2014. And I think you've seen Etienne's uh, question, uh, Neil, how do you cope with logging on bird lasser while guiding? I find it difficult to do this without looking away from the forest. <laughs> yeah, you've got to be able to um, look with one eye and uh, look at the cell phone with the other eye. <laughs> it's multitasking. Uh, someone says side bill is great, even she can use it. Uh... Agreed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm seeing there's a sign that says four new messages, but there's nothing there. Okay, um, that's the end of the, uh, the questions, I think. Um, does anybody else have one last question before we call it the evening? And he says, thanks, Neil, great talk. Uh, Ian Grant says, uh, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, yeah, so, thanks, so we everybody. are going, we, Sorry, Neil, go ahead. I say thanks everyone for attending and uh, I hope I didn't bore you too much and I hope you've learned a little bit from it. Um, yeah, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Yeah, I certainly look, I certainly learned a lot from it. And uh, um, I think that, you know, we probably going to have a masterclass on the subject of, uh, of this talk. Uh, so keep an eye on the site and, uh, and see when it's coming up. So thanks everybody for attending. It, it's been a really good uh, webinar and uh, we've enjoyed having you here and uh, we'll see you next time. And thanks Neil very much for this. Thank you. Good night, everybody.